My first guest will keep us up to date on the current research regarding work from home arrangements and the results are surprising and could help companies and employees prepare for a post pandemic world. Joining me from Dubai is Oliver Baxter, the Inside Program Manager of Herman Miller Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa. Hey Oliver, it's good to see you again and thank you so much for joining this conversation all the way from Dubai. My pleasure, David. Thank you very much for having me, sir. All right, it's been over five months, at least for us here in the Philippines, of working from home. And we're starting to hear more companies, not just in the country, but all over the world, saying that this may no longer be a temporary arrangement. In fact, uh, we're starting to hear more people saying this could be a permanent feature of business and employment, not just some emergency experiment in employment, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's really two camps. There's one one kind of organization that is recommending that their people don't rush back to the physical office straight away and haven't given a definite time for when they need to come back in. And then there's other organizations that have actually realized the benefits of remote working and working from home and are actually starting to think that maybe they don't need offices quite as much as they first thought. Um, I think it's kind of like a combination between the two. We very much still need offices today. Uh, although a lot of the data from working from home has been um, pretty encouraging and quite positive, we still need the physical office to serve a number of very important issues like learning from one another, um, like um, being able to have social interactions as well. Very difficult to do that through the medium of technology. So I think we're always going to need offices, but yeah, we can definitely start to capitalize more on the remote working. But after five months of working from home, it's now possible to gauge its impact on employee experience because uh, in those five months or, or four months where people have been working from their homes, there have been a lot of surveys, a lot of research that, that has come out. So let's go specifically to the impact on certain aspects of, of, of work. Let's start with productivity. Are we more productive or less productive because we're, we're at home? There's a caveat to all of this because we've had lockdown for five months. That has been the largest, and I know everybody's saying this, it's been the largest uh, experiment from, from working at home that has ever been done. But who's really been kind of um, looking at it as an experiment and trying to survey it. So the data that I have is from, uh, is from Gallup. Many people will be familiar with Gallup, one of the largest research institutes in the world. Then there's the Leasman Index that looks at specifically about work and its relationship to real estate, but now looking at working from home. And then there's another company in the UK, smaller sample set, they're called ART Solutions. And they've been looking at it from a well-being side as well. So Gallup have actually highlighted that the sweet spot if you care about your employees being engaged with work and engagement being that happy, enthusiastic employee that's a joy to be around and work with, then the sweet spot is allowing them to work remotely. So that can be from home, it can be from coffee shops and co-working facilities as well. But the key is the remote working there is between 60 and 80% of the time. So you want them to be out of the office for around three to four days a week, according to Gallup's data. And that was a longitudinal study and that came out in 2017, so before any of this lockdown really happened. The stereotype of the, uh, of the, uh, of the employee who's wasting away in his cubicle, that's in a way true. It's been parodied in Dilbert's and parodied in The Office, uh, that series on TV. Uh, there's, a, there's a grain of truth to that. Yeah, I mean, the, the cubicle specifically should have never really happened. I mean, the, the furniture that created the cubicle was from Herman Miller. It was called Action Office back in the day, but it was actually designed to be flexible, not to just put people in little boxes. But that was the easiest to do for planning and to make sure you could uh, you know, manage your people. But actually, it was never really a good idea to begin with. So a lot of offices are not very productive. So if you look at the data from the Leasman Index about working from home, um, what their data is really showing, and this is 50,000 respondents from over um, 300 companies, and it's in 61 different countries, I believe. What they're showing is that actually working from home, 80% of people agree, uh, agree um, that working from home enables them to work productively. Whereas actually, if you contrast that with their data from working in the office, there's only 62% agreement from working in the office. That is a significantly larger sample size, however, that's over 700,000 respondents. But then there's something called the Leasman Plus, which is the most highly performing organizations, the top 20% um, of organizations they've ever surveyed, so the best working offices in the world. Only 78% of their employees agree that their workplace enables them to work productively. So you can see that actually working from home People seem to prefer that. that. That seems to be the closest associated with their productivity sentiment agreement in comparison to even the best performing offices. 
So I think there's a lot that we can learn from working from home. But again, this is just during lockdown for this specific piece of data. You know, you hear the oft-repeated argument of, but what about corporate culture? What about collaboration? What about creativity? These are things that people imbibe and people are able to feel when they're together, uh, physically, with, with their peers or in groups. So what does the research tell us? Yeah, I think the, the, the data they have around corporate culture is really associated with that early uh, data that I referenced from Gallup around engagement because culture is so multifaceted, you know, it's mm -hmm. for many people it's, it's the way that we do things around here. Uh, but I like to look at in the context of engagement. So still, you know, um, engagement is at an all time low the world over, but it seems to be more effective if we allow employees to work more remotely. So it stands to reason the more autonomy that you give an employee, you know, the, the harder they're going to work because the happier they are as well, because who doesn't want freedom right <laughs> everybody wants freedom and autonomy if we look at collaboration um, because of course you know lots of, there's a big school of thought everyone was thinking well we can't collaborate now we're working from home well again from Leesman's data that, that doesn't seem to be the case from their um, workplace data that 81% um, uh, of people were being able to um, effectively collaborate in, in workplaces today whereas comparing that to their work from home data it was 87% people agreed that collaboration, you know, they could still um, uh, work productively, collaboratively. Now, what about career advancement? The, the argument has always been that if I'm out of, my, out of sight, I'm out of mind. My boss doesn't see me. He only sees me once every two weeks on, in a Zoom meeting. Yeah. I mean, there's that feeling like I'm missing out. I'm not seen. I'm not heard. And I, it might affect my career advancement. When we're talking about career advancement, it's also about professional development as well. So learning from others, that has been one of the main areas that has been um, negatively affected by working from home. So you're more effect effective at learning from others when you're co-located in the same physical workspace, as opposed to trying to do that remotely. It's still possible, but it's more complicated to do it. As well as those informal interactions, which is what you're alluding to, like casual conversations with your boss that build rapport and trust amongst you. Um, so when it comes to career advancement, it might be more tricky working from home if you look at it through the lens of learning from others and informal social interactions. Uh, and, and, and let's go to well-being and mental health. I mean, popular culture has always made fun of the office space uh, in terms of people, em employees who are at a dead end, employees who are bored. But there's a downside to working from home as well. At least the research uh, hints at that in terms of our well-being and, and, and our mental health issues. Yeah, so my, my background is actually in psychology. That's what I did my postgraduate studies in. So um, working for a furniture company like Herman Miller, that's what they employ me to, to look through that lens into the office world as, as a psychologist and make recommendations for how you can um, change your space and to have a positive uh, impact on, on the employees. So it's not just about selling the most amount of furniture, it's about creating the right environment for employees to work uh, and perform their best. So I also mentioned there was a, a third research institute that I'd be referencing today, and that was uh, ART Solutions. Now this is a company from the UK, um, looking at some of the similar stuff that I've been talking about earlier on, about supporting activities and the physical working environment. They took it another step further and started to look at well-being as well. So they started to track people with you know, these sorts of smart um, mm -hmm. devices. Mm -hmm. So they were looking at sleep, they were looking at physical activity. And again, you know, during lockdown, it's not all been a bed of roses, but you know, some things have been good as well. Um, so if we look at um, uh, physical activity, it's actually reduced during lockdown, but it kind of stands to reason if you can't leave the house, it's gonna be pretty difficult to get your steps in. So they started to notice an average of around 2000 steps a day in reduction when working from home. So they were becoming more sedentary. On average, 58 minutes um, were spent being more sedentary than, um, than pre-lockdown. Um, I think it's because we want to produce that maximum amount of output because we don't have that input measure of my boss can see me working. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure I'm producing my maximum amount of output. And also, what else do I have to do? <laughs> you know, I've run through everything on, uh, on my streaming devices. I've got no shows left to watch. So I might as well, you know, respond to that, that email a little later into the evening, which I wouldn't recommend that you do that. We do need to try and, I don't think separate, but kind of, there, there is no work-life balance anymore in my mind. There is a blend, but you, you, you taper off and you, and you taper on. So 
some days you start a little earlier, some days a little later, and, and finish at those appropriate times as well. Are there certain types or a profile of worker or employee who, who adapts better to the work from home arrangement in terms of demographics, in terms of maybe other psychological uh, uh, aspects or personality aspects of the employee? So the biggest uh, uh, association uh, correlation, if you will, that we found was actually um, uh, your, your home setup. So if you've got your own dedicated office that's separate from everyone else and every other room in the house, then you are likely to be more productive, perform better than someone who's working from a dining room table. Again, kind of, it's pretty self-explanatory, but that's what the data is showing. Working from a dining table, it's not ideal. I did it, you know, when, when lockdown happened for me, I was, on, I was on paternity leave. So even though I worked for the furniture company that invented ergonomic furniture, I didn't have one lick of ergonomic furniture. So I was working from my standing height dining table. I, every, everywhere is standing height in my house. It was designed to be social. So there's no actual traditional seated height here. Uh, but then when things started to ease, I was able to go into the office and kind of, you know, pick out, you know, some, some ergonomic tools. And, uh, and actually, that company is, uh, as, as with other companies, um, has started to give an allowance for us. So we, we have $750 at Herman Miller to put towards, towards ergonomic tools. So that doesn't have to be just from us. It could be keyboards, laptop jacks, mouse, you know. Um, so um, so the, the biggest indicator of whether you're going to have a positive work, work from home experience is being able to have that, that own dedicated private space. You know, Oliver, as to the research that's available is telling us um, a majority feel uh, more comfortable working from home, more productive working at home. Um, how to prepare employees for re-entry into the offices? And eventually, uh, it may not go back to the five-day work week, but eventually we'll all have to troop back to our offices, to our cubicles maybe. How do you think companies should, uh, should manage this re-entry? Yeah, I, I don't want anyone to think that the conversations that we've been having so far is me saying that the offices are no longer relevant. That is not the case. Still, lots of people are dying and itching, myself included, to go back to the office. I'm uh, allowed to go back for one day a week currently uh, at the moment. And I, you know, I relish the fact that I can go in and I wish there was more employees to connect with because that's what I'm missing is that social element and being able to do high performance work that I might struggle to do when uh, I'm at home. So offices are still very, very relevant, but we need to make sure that they are safe. And at Herman Miller, we have a saying that we need to help first and sell second. So we've been having conversations with clients to help educate them on, on what the current research is saying. And I emphasize current because it keeps changing. You know, when, when COVID first happened, we thought that, um, you know, sneezing and coughs, you know, those were, were the biggest issues. But now we started to understand that aerosol, aerosolization of particles might linger for, for hours in, in the atmosphere and in the air. So the, the, the air conditioning, the HVAC systems could be one of the biggest issues that's facing um, workplaces today to make sure that they're not spreading COVID. Because, you know, even if you're physically distancing two meters from somebody, well, if it's in the air, then that kind of mitigates the, the real need to do physical distancing. So um, we, we need to look at a, a variety of interventions or what we call a bundle approach at Herman Miller. We, we've taken that from our work in healthcare because we do a, a lot of um, hospitals as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we understand that there's no magic bullet to any of this stuff. There's mm -hmm. no one solution, but there is a bundle approach of uh, if you have a series of evidence-based interventions that will help mitigate the, the, the spread of, of COVID-19. Um, but then there are other interventions that make sense but aren't based in data and science. So I'm hearing lots of requests from clients to put screens and division up in their office um, and I'm like okay so again you know COVID is in the air that will go over and around and under screens. Um, so what that really is doing is providing psychological safety. So when people come in, they can see that there's been interventions in the office, I've been thought of, I can, I can relax. And that can help them be more productive because they now feel more uh, psychologically safe. Whereas if you walk into the office and there's like dust on a surface, you're like, well, if there's dust there, then what's happening with COVID? Um, mm -hmm. So we, we say that the office is a proxy for quality. You know, if you come into the office and you, you don't feel like quality is there, then you're not gonna feel safe to do your best work. So screens are good for increasing psychological safety but that's pretty much all. It's not great at, at, spread, at preventing the spread of COVID-19. So apparently also from the research, we're looking 
uh, at the fact that it's younger people, ironically, who want to go back to the office, who are less comfortable working from home. We've always thought that young people wanted the independence, wanted the flexibility, but that's not always the truth. Yeah, the, uh, the tech savvy generation, right? <laughs> well, I'm part of that generation. Uh, I might have aged out of the, the youngest generation, but I'm, I'm still part of it. I'd say that we we're more tech dependent than tech savvy. And again, if you, if you look at the, 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 the association with productivity is those that have their own dedicated office space at home have the highest performance according to the Leisman Index. So the younger generations really struggle to have that occur because they don't have you know, the, um, the, the money to invest in a larger property that older generations might have. So actually the younger generations are the least happy with working from home. And then also you have to take into account that learning from others really struggles to be done digitally which of course is the, the, the first thing that happens when you start a job or you start your profession is you spend a lot of the time learning from others. So the younger you are, the less likely, uh, sorry, the, the less happy you are with working from home, but the happier you are with working from an office, which I think is quite ironic from the data because I've attended hundreds of conferences where people have stood up there and said that, you know, the millennials and the Gen Zs are the hardest to cater for in offices today. Show, show me the data to, to suggest that that's the case. I think, I think that there's been a, a lot of negativity associated with the younger generations and how, uh, how much of a diva we all are, but that, that doesn't seem to be the case from, from the data. We're the happiest generation in offices today. Again, the older you are or the longer in tenure, the less happy you are with your physical office working environment, but the more happy you are with working from home. How else do you think offices should be designed uh, to, to, to welcome back employees who, again, as you said, uh, perhaps were spoiled with working from home? Um, I think there was a lot of learnings before COVID happened. There was a, a hell of a lot of wasted space in offices before. So if we're doing the knee-jerk, here and near reactions to, to COVID-19, um, then you know, there's a lot of space that was being uninhabited, any, uh, uninhabited anyway. So we can still maintain that distancing in the physical workplace when we have um, a, a subset of people coming into the office at any given moment in time. So not having 100% returning all at once, but maybe having 20 to 30% on a given day and understanding that we had more space than we needed to begin with anyway should really help mitigate some of those factors. But that's, that's the here and near. In, in the long term, I, I see that small offices will probably become a little bit smaller mm. um, and we'll start to um, see this kind of hub and spoke model uh, increasing. So we have a centralized HQ, probably for the, uh, the onboarding and the younger generations of employees. And then as you increase with tenure or age in the organization, then maybe you can work more remotely, closer to where you live from like a co-working or a smaller satellite office, um, and also benefit from um, working from home as well. It's an interesting times, Oliver. Thanks so much for this conversation and stay well. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, David.